Mutle Ujesu, a warm welcome to our weekly Bible study. We are going to be continuing with our study on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, which is theologically called pneumatology. Our foundational scripture is found in James chapter 2, verse 26, which reads as follows. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Let us pray. Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, here we present ourselves tonight to receive your word. We ask you, our Lord, for we understand there is no greater teacher except you, that you may teach us tonight, that you may give us understanding about the gift which you have given us, the gift and the promise of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you may remove any false understanding and give us the right and the true understanding about your Holy Spirit. I also present myself that you may use me, that I may be your vessel, that you may speak your oracles tonight through my mouth. Remove anything within and without me that may act as a hindrance or as an obstacle for you to be able to teach freely tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Amen. I want us to focus on, as we look at our theme verse, it says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. But our focus, I want us to focus on the first part of this, of this verse, which says, For as the body without the spirit is dead. This means that if the spirit of a man departs from him, the person is considered dead. In the like manner, if the body of Christ, that is the church, is void of the Spirit of God, it too is considered to be dead. There exists no church without the Holy Spirit. He was there in the inception of the church at the day of Pentecost and will forever be with her as the Lord has declared when he was about to depart and leave his disciples. He said to them, the helper, the Holy Spirit, is going to be with you forever. The life of the church is therefore not drawn from its church leaders. It is not drawn from its religious practices. It is not drawn from its many rituals she performs, but it is solely drawn from the Holy Spirit. Also, it is even not drawn from the 12 disciples that the Lord chose. John puts it in this way, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing in John chapter 6, verse 63. We are therefore nothing and we can achieve nothing without the help of the Holy Spirit. The Lord gave a command to his disciples when he was about to be taken up into heaven by the cloud. He said to them, they must not depart in Jerusalem, but they must remain there until they receive the Holy Spirit. When they receive the Holy Spirit, then they shall be his witnesses unto Jerusalem, Judea, uh, Samaria, and unto the ends of the earth. Now, mind you, that these same disciples that the Lord is giving them this command not to depart from Jerusalem are the same disciples which he had sent prior in Acts chapter 10, performing the same things. They were to preach, they were to teach, and they were to heal and deliver. But now he is warning them, or rather he is commanding them, that, boys, I don't want you to use experience. You need the Holy Spirit to be able to perform this work of witnessing. Yes, in the past or earlier, you did witness, but now as I'm living, you cannot witness, you cannot be my witness except through the Holy Spirit. This gives us an idea of how important Holy Spirit is in the life of a believer or in the life of the worker in the house of the Lord. As we pursue this study of the Holy Spirit, we hope to have our attitude changed toward him by the end of it. Let us look at the definition of the word pneumatology. 
The word pneumatology is made up of two Greek words. It is the first word is pneuma, and the second word is logos. The word pneuma means breath. It means the spirit. It means wind. The word logos means a study. So when you put the two together, the word pneumatology means a study or the doctrine of the spirit, or if you like, the Holy Spirit. Now, let us do a quick recap of what we have covered in previous lessons. We have looked at theology proper, which is the study of God, God the Father. We have looked at God the Father as, we have looked at God and, 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 and we said that we have one God, yet there are three persons. Even though there are three persons and each person is God himself, we do not have three gods, but we have one God. If you were to make a mathematical uh, uh, example, which in fact doesn't make sense, but this is a, a divine mathematical example, you add one plus one plus one, you get one. So that's what it means. We do not have three gods, but we have one God. So that's what we looked at. Then we moved on further to look at the second person of the Godhead. That is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We looked at his humanity. We looked at his deity. And we also looked at his offices. In looking at his humanity, we said that the Lord Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. At some point in time, being Logos, he took, on, he took upon himself the nature of a man. So then the nature, the new nature that was formed at the union of the human nature and the divine nature is known as the incarnate Logos. So when we say that the Lord Jesus Christ is 100% man and 100% God, we, say, we, we mean that when these two natures came together, it did not take just a portion of man and a portion of God, but he is fully man and fully God. And there is no mingling with these two natures. These two natures coexist as one new nature, which is the nature of the incarnate Logos. We then looked at his deity. We said that he is co-equal, he is co-eternal and co-existent with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now we are studying the third member of the triune God. We have looked uh, in the past two lessons uh, as we were taken through by teacher uh, Tole. We looked at the personhood of the Holy Spirit. That is, we looked at that, we said that Holy Spirit is not a force, nor a power, but he is a person. That he is able to speak to us, he is able to love, and he is able to teach. Today, we shall continue to look at the third member of the triune God, the Holy Spirit. We will look at a few things. We will look at his deity. And in looking at his deity, we are going to revisit uh, Trinity, the study of Trinity, a bit. His work, we are going to look, secondly, we are going to look at his work in the life and in the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thirdly, we are going to, to, to having, when you know uh, his life and his work in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, then we are going to move to study his importance in the life of a believer. We are going to then move and look at the gift of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit has gifts. And then lastly, we are going to look at the fruit of the Spirit. Holy Spirit is the most unfortunate person of the persons of the Trinity. Why do I say so? It is because he is the most misunderstood even by those who confess him. He is not only misunderstood by the world, but he is, mostly, he is even misunderstood by the Christendom. His work is also misunderstood and less appreciated. 
This then deprives us of the opportunity of fully enjoying the benefits he comes with. In the same breath, it also deprives him of being able to fully perform his duties, which he has been sent to perform in our lives as the believers. Before we look at the deity of the Holy Spirit, I would like us to first consider the two aspects of the Trinity. As I've mentioned earlier, that as we're going to be looking at the Trinity, we'll revisit, as we're going to be looking at the deity rather, we are going to revisit Trinity, but we are going to look at in the aspect of uh, ontological aspect as well as economical uh, aspect. That is, we are going to be looking at the, the ontological trinity as well as the economic trinity. These are two ways uh, of talking about God, of talking about who God is and what he does. Now, failure to understand the distinction between these two will throw us into confusion, will make us to misinterpret the scriptures, and maybe will even or ultimately uh, cause us to be deceived. It is therefore it is difficult for us to, for, for one to comprehend the co-equality among the persons of the Godhead if one were to be considering the following verses which we are going to be we are going to read just now. Let us look at John chapter 10, uh, 30 to 33, and John chapter 14, verse 28, which reads as follows. John 10, 30 to 33. I, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered, uh, answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy and because you being men make yourself God. The next verse, John chapter 14, verse 28. It reads as follows. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Now, when you look at those two verses, the first one, which says, we're just going to take just one portion. My father is greater than I, which is John 14, verse 28. And John says, I and my father are, are one. When you look at these two verses, there appears to be some sort of contradiction. But in fact, there is no contradiction. It is just the way, it is just, it is just that we need to understand how to approach and how to view the Trinity. Now, when, when we speak about the ontological Trinity as well as the uh, economical Trinity, we are not saying that there are two Trinities, but we are saying there are two ways of understanding the Godhead and viewing the existence and the, and the, and the relationship between the three persons. Now, let us look at economic trinity, economical trinity, rather. The word economical means management of a home. As you know, we have home economics. Now, economical trinity refers to how the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit interact with each other, especially in their management of creation. They each exercise different roles in their management of creation as well as salvation. Each person has a different responsibility and even authority. Let us, uh, let us look at Galatians 4, verse 4. It reads as follows, But when the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So you can see here, the Lord Jesus Christ, or rather Apostle Paul through the Holy Spirit says, God the Father sent forth his son in the fullness of time. So it is God who is sending forth the son. So economically, God is, uh, is greater than the son. 
That's why God is the one who, is, who has authority over the Son, who has authority over the second person of the Trinity. He is the one who is sending him to die for us. So when we look at the economical Trinity, we are looking at that. According to work, God, the Father, or economically, according to their work of, of, of creation and according to their work of salvation, God the Father is greater than God the Son. So a, this, is, this is a term used in trying to explain what we know of God based on what he does. What has God, what has God done? God has created uh, everything that we see and everything that we, have, we, we do not see. God has brought salvation unto us. Now, these persons of the Trinity, they occupy or have different roles or have different authorities. Now, let us move on to look at ontological Trinity. When we look at ontological Trinity, we are looking at the being and the existence of God. Who God is outside of what or beyond everything that he has created and which he has done. This, is, um, this has to do with the existence and personal interaction of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit beyond the act of creation and salvation. In order to know what God has always been, we have to go back into history before the multiverses which is impossible. So for us to know what God has always been, this means we have to go back into history. We cannot go back into, in, in, into, into eternity. So therefore, however, now there is consistency between uh, who God is and what he does. If there is consistency between who God is and what he does, we can therefore deduce who God is from what he has done or from what he does. Let me, let me make an, 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 an example. We know that God is love because God has sent forth his son to die for us in, in, in time. That is his work of uh, salvation. So knowing that God does not change, we can therefore extrapolate and say, Ontologically, God is love because we know that uh, economically uh, God has sent forth his son, God being greater than the son, he sent forth his son to die for us. So God is love. That's why John says God is love in his letters. So that's how we are able to know God. We are able to know God by looking at what he has done and then we extrapolate knowing that God does not change. He is consistent. Then we are able to extrapolate to know what God has always been and what God will always be. When we say we extrapolate, we mean we are using the available data or the available information that we have of God. This information is received or we receive it, if I can say economically. This information, we are therefore able to use it to know what God has always been. So, in short, we can say economic, economical trinity gives us ontological trinity. So, what God has done, from what God has done and from what God does, we are able to know who God is and what God will always be. So, now, in conclusion, looking at these two uh, aspects of trinity, the person of the trinity the, the persons of the Trinity are equal in being but subordinate in roles. So, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in being, in existence, they are equal. They are equal in power, they are equal in glory, they are equal in knowledge. But when it comes to the roles that they play in creation, when it comes to the roles that they play in salvation, they are not equal. The Father is greater than the Son. The Son is, or the Holy Spirit submits to the, 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 the Son. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ says, um, the Holy Spirit has come not to glorify himself, but he is going to glorify me. 
He will not speak of his own, of his own authority, but he is going to take off what is mine and he's going to declare it to you. Why? Because economically, the Holy Spirit submits to the Son. Though, though the Holy Spirit has the ability to do things on his own, but the Holy Spirit, according to their roles, according to their ministries, no one crosses boundaries in the Trinity, but everyone keeps his cause. Now, this is a lesson that maybe we can learn as the children of God, that though even though we are equal, we might be equal or we might uh, consider ourselves to be able to do work better than the other person, but we ought to stick to our role. Now that we have looked and we have examined the two ways of looking at the Trinity, that is being an existence of how they relate to each other in roles and responsibility, we are now in a better position to study the deity of the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is a divine person. That means he is God. He is the third member of the triune God. Now that we understand that him being declared or being referred as the third member does not make him less than the Son or less than the, Holy, uh, less than the Father, but it speaks of his role that he plays. So the Holy Spirit is therefore co-equal, he is co-eternal and he is co-existent with the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. And yes, all three are co-equal, co-existent and co-eternal. Now, we are going to look at the deity of or examine the deity of the Holy Spirit as by divine association with the Father and the Son. The, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are linked together as one in a baptismal command of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Lord Jesus Christ has been, had been raised from the dead and he was about to ascend into heaven, he gave a great commission to his disciples. He said to, he said to them, Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name, as in, in one name, that name incorporates all the three persons of the Trinity. In the name of the Father, in the, in the, name of the, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we see that there is association uh, of the Holy Spirit with the other two persons of the Godhead. The Lord Jesus Christ taught that the Holy Spirit is one with the Father and with himself. Now let us look at John chapter 14 verse 16 and see what it says. And I, pray, and I will pray the Father and he will send you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to his disciples. He said, I will pray to the Father that he will give you another helper. The word another helper means alos parakletos. Now, taking the word another in Greek, it has two meanings. There is the word, the word another in Greek means alos, and also it means heteros where those who, are, who do science, they will know that they, 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 there is a word that is called hetero, homogeneous, homogeneous reaction and heterogeneous reaction or heterogeneous mixture. That is a mixture of two different things. For example, we may take uh, the mixture of, though they are in, in the mixture of water and ice in, as in two different phases. That is a heterogeneous mixture. Now, looking at the word alos, the word alos means another of the same kind, and the word uh, heteros is another of a different kind. So, the word that the Lord Jesus Christ used in Matthew 14 verse 16 is alos, not heteros. So, he said, so, so now he's saying, I will send you another of the same kind as I am, meaning this helper is going to be as I am, as I am God, he is God also. As I am omnipotent, he is omnipotent also. As I am omniscient, knowing all things, he also is omniscient and knows all things. 
as I was your helper, your comforter, he also is or he is going to be your helper and your comforter. So this shows that the helper is fully God as Jesus is. Now let us look at this uh, another comforter and consider the state of the mind of the disciples. I want us to pause a bit, just look at the state of the mind when the Lord Jesus Christ said to them, I will send you another comforter. Now, if we look at, at what time the Lord spoke these words, it was a time when he was about to leave, he was about to depart and ascend into heaven. He said to them, I will send you another comforter. Let's look at uh, John chapter 16, verse 7. He says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I depart, I will send him to you. As I've said, I want us to look at the state of the mind when the Lord spoke, spoke these words. The Lord had said depressing words to the disciples that he was leaving them. So when he said, when, when he spoke to them of another helper, they probably could not understand him as they were still filled with sorrow. As he says in John chapter 16, verse, verse 6, that these disciples, now we have, as I've said that I'm about to, to, to depart, you are now filled with sorrow. So the disciples were filled with sorrow when the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am going to send you another comforter or another helper. And who can blame them? The men whom they have come to believe to be their deliverer from their Roman oppression was about to leave them. Mind you, the, 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 the Jews at that time, they were under the Roman oppression. So they, they, they believed that the Lord Jesus Christ was their deliverer. They are promised a Messiah. They are promised a prophet which Moses, through the inspiration of God, promised to them in Deuteronomy 18, verse 18, when he said, God is going to send you a prophet like me, a prophet like Moses. So now, they have come to, uh, to, 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 to accept and to know that this Jesus is this promised uh, Messiah. He is this promised deliverer. He is this promised prophet like Moses. As Moses uh, delivered Israel from the slavery of Egypt, they believed that the Lord Jesus Christ was going to provide or bring physical deliverance to Israel under the oppression of the Romans. So one could understand their sorrow that they have Jesus Christ was their hope and now their hope was about to depart from them. So when the Lord said it was to their advantage that, they should, they should, that, that he should leave, they probably became confused because how can it be our advantage that our deliverer now is leaving us in this oppression? How can we know, even if we accept what he says that, okay, I will send you another helper, how then can we know that this another will be able to deliver us? For at least with uh, Jesus, they have come to believe him. They have seen his works. They have seen his power. They have seen that he's a, he, he was a man of authority who spoke with great authority. So he had, he had provided all the qualities or the characteristics of being the deliverer for them. Now, this, uh, this, this another now that the Lord Jesus Christ is promising them, they do not have like... They don't know whether this uh, another will be able to deliver them. Now, it took our Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years for him to come because the time between Moses and the time of his coming and incarnating the flesh, that is a period of about 2,000 years. The time when he was promised to Israel uh, through the mouth of Moses in the book of Exodus, or rather in the book of Deuteronomy 18, when, the, when God said, I am going to raise up a prophet like Moses to the time of his coming, that is 2,000 years. Now, this, now, if the Lord took about 2,000 years to come, the disciples did not, or 
would have been confused or even if they wanted to, 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 to embrace and to accept the coming of the Holy Spirit, it would have been difficult for them considering all these points that if the Lord, if it took the Lord 2,000 years for him to come, how long will it take this another to come and deliver Israel? Does it mean now that you are probably going to stay at least a 2,000 years under the oppression of the, 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 the Romans? Yet still, even in that uh, uh, confusion, the disciples were seeking the weight of eternal life. They remained with Jesus, even though they did not fully understand what he said or meant. Now, this is also a lesson for us to learn, that we do not follow Jesus because we agree with his ways. We do not follow Jesus because he has done something for us. We do not follow Jesus because all things are going well in our lives, but we follow Jesus solely because in him, or he has the weight of life. Now, this advantage was a confusion to them because it was difficult to, to, to understand in what way is this advantageous to us. Now, let us look at this advantage, how it was advantageous to them that the Lord Jesus Christ had to live and then the Holy Spirit had to come. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, during his earthly ministry, he was not able to be in different places at once. He was able to be at one place at once. Though he had all the abilities, for example, to heal Lazarus, but because he was not in the place where Lazarus was, he could not heal him. Yes, I know that at a later stage, he did raise him from the dead. But when you look at Mary and Martha, they say, and they, they said, if you, Master, if you had been here, our brother would have not died. So that tells us that the Lord was limited in that place. He could not be at different places in, at, 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 at once. But now the advantage is that, the advantage of this helper, as the Lord says, it is to your advantage that, that I live, which the disciples failed to, to, to understand how it was to their advantage. The advantage is that when the Holy Spirit, he is the same as God in terms of being God and having all the attributes of God, he is able to be with us always. There is no time where he is not going to be able to be with us. There is no time where we will, be, we will say, Lord, if you have been here, I would have not been in this situation. If you have been here, I would have not stumbled there. If you have been here, I would, I would, I would, I would have not been able to misunderstand this or that. So this is the advantage that the Lord was, uh, was insinuating. He was saying that the Holy Spirit, he is going to be able to be with you forever. There is no time when you are going to need him and you are not going to find him. Now, as the disciples failed to understand this advantage, even the Christendom now is, has not yet fully understood this advantage. This is why the church, which the Lord said concerning it, the gate of Hades are not going to prevail against it, is living a life of defeat because it has jostled the helper out of, out of the church. In Zechariah 4, the Lord Jesus, the God says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. But the church of today, it has removed Holy Spirit out of the church. As we said earlier, the church, the body without the spirit is dead. So, the church without the Holy Spirit is dead. So, every church that does not embrace Holy Spirit can be considered, or in the eyes of God, is viewed as dead. The believers, this is why also the believers are, falling, are, are failing to overcome temptation and passing every test that comes their way. It is because we have not embraced, we have not understood this advantage with the Lord, which the Lord speaks of, which the Lord spoke of when he spoke to, to, to his disciples and said, it is to your advantage that I live. 
So even we ourselves, we are failing to, ad to understand this advantage. That's why we are, fa that's why we are failing uh, the test. That's why we are stumbling in temptation. The word of God says in 2 Peter, as his divine power has given us all things to live a godly life. Now, where does this divine power come from? This divine power for us as believers to live a godly life, it comes from no one else except the Holy Spirit. Because God does nothing through might, through power, but it does all things through the Holy Spirit. So we also, as the believers and the church, need to embrace the Holy Spirit. Now, coming back to the deity of the Spirit, we, the apostles also taught that also taught oneness of the Godhead. That okay. Now let us look at 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 First John chapter five verse seven. For there are three that bear witness in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. So we see the association when, 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 when the apostle speaks of those who bear witness in heaven. There is association when the Father is where, where the Father and the Son is mentioned, Holy Spirit is Holy Spirit is mentioned also as being the, 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 the witness. As it says there are three that bear witness in heaven. It is the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit is deity. Holy Spirit is God. So wherever, holy, wherever the other two persons are, Holy Spirit is always there. For example, whenever there is a summit of the presidents of the world, we always assume that everyone who is in that summit is a president. Anyone who is not a president will not be or will not form part of that summit. So we have seen and looked at these scriptures through this uh, association that Holy Spirit is always among the, the other persons of the Trinity, proving that Holy Spirit is God. Now, let us move further to look at Holy Spirit as, by divine association also, that we see, we also see him uh, we also see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at Jesus' baptism. So, what, when, when, when the Lord Jesus Christ was baptized by John, the Word of God declares that the Holy Spirit descended as a dove, and the Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son, my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So, we also, again, in that instant, in that situation, see that when where the son is where the father is the holy spirit is also among them in administration of the church gift the holy spirit the holy spirit is also demonstrated as a god in first corinthians chapter 12 verse 6 to verse 8 which we are going to look at later on when we consider the gift of the spirit we see there that they are gifts from the father they are gifts from the Lord Jesus Christ as well as gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, let us look at him by divine distinction from the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit, the Son is sent by the Father and the Holy Spirit. Let us look at uh, Isaiah 48 verse 12, which reads as follows. Come near to me, hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord and his Spirit have sent me. I'm going to read it, read it again. And now the Lord God and his Spirit has sent me. So the Son is declaring that he has been sent by the Father and the Lord. So the Holy, this proves again that the Holy Spirit is God. The second point, Holy Spirit is partaker of the triune name 
the name in administering baptism. The Lord said to his disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, even there, we see that the Holy Spirit is mentioned as being the partaker of partaker in that name, the name of the, the baptismal name. This name is revealed in Acts chapter two, uh, when, 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 when Apostle Peter had preached his first sermon, that this name is Jesus. The believer has access to the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, verse 18. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. So by divine distinction from the Father, it has been proved or proven through these few points and these verses that the Holy Spirit is God. Now let us look at by his divine attributes ascribed to him. We are going to divide this into two parts, the essential attributes as well as the moral attributes. Now, the essential attributes, God, Holy Spirit, or oh, He is God. Holy Spirit is God. As we look at Acts chapter 5, consider Acts chapter 5 from verse 3 to 4, which says, When the disciples or oh, when the disciples were sharing everything amongst themselves, then uh, there was a family of Ananias as well as Sapphira who also sold their possession. And in selling their possession, what they brought to the disciples was not the actual amount of what they sold their possession. So now when, 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 when Peter, when they brought this, this um, the, 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 when they brought this money at the feet of the apostle, Peter, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said unto Ananias and his wife Sapphira, Why have you done this? What you have done, you have not lied against men, but you have lied against God. So this shows that Holy Spirit is indeed God. Now also, Holy Spirit, he is eternal. It tells us in Hebrews 9 verse 14 that our Lord Jesus Christ offered himself up through the eternal spirit. Holy Spirit is also omnipotent. Omnipotent means he is all-powerful. Here, when we look at Job chapter 33, verse 4, it tells us his power of creation, creating man or making man. Job says, The Spirit of the Lord has made me. The breath of the Almighty has given me life. Holy Spirit, he is also omniscient, meaning he knows all things. He has knowledge of all things. He said to his disciples, the Lord Jesus Christ said to his disciples when he, spoke of, when he spoke of the helper, that he is going to teach you all things and going to bring to remembrance the things that I, I, I have taught you. So when he says he is going to teach us all things, it means that the helper knows all things because he cannot teach us all things if he knows but just a little. He is also omnipresent, meaning there is nowhere where he is not. He is in heaven. He is in earth. He is in the past. He is in the present. He is in the future. He is in the past without living. He is in the present without living the past. He is in the future without living the, the, the present as well as the past. So, Holy Spirit is omnipresent. Psalms 139, the psalmist says, Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I lay my bed in Sheol, behold, you are also there. So Holy Spirit is omnipresent. He is present everywhere. This proves that he is God. He is a deity. He is the source of life. Now, moving further on, we are going to look, looking at his moral attribute. Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Holy Spirit is the spirit of love. Holy Spirit is also the spirit of holiness. Romans chapter 1 verse 4 
speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was declared the Son of God according to the spirit of holiness. He was declared the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So Holy Spirit is the spirit of holiness. So by these divine attributes, truth, love, just to mention a few, and holiness, he is, they prove that Holy Spirit is God. Now, moving further on, let us look at his divine works being attributed to him. He was active in creation of the world as well as in creation of the beast and man. Genesis chapter 1 tells us that the Spirit of the Lord was hovering upon the face of the water. He is active in the regeneration of a fallen man. When the Lord was speaking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, uh, when Nicodemus came at night to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ said to Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And in verse 5 he said, unless you are born of spirit and water, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, this shows us that Holy Spirit is indeed deity because even in the regeneration of a fallen man, he is involved in that work. He is active in the resurrection of the body. He was active in the inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. The Word of God says that all Scripture is God-breath. It also says in 2 Peter chapter 1 that, they, that no prophecy is of its own origin, or, or original, uh, is of its own origin, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved or carried by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is involved in the inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. All this proves that the Holy Spirit is truly God. He is not just some mere power. Now, let us look at his work in the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. At his birth, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, he was the agent. He overshadowed Mary. The word of God says when Gabriel spoke to Mary, he said, the spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. So, the Holy Spirit was there in the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, making sure that he comes as a sinless uh, person, he comes as a sinless man. This was very important because for him to be able to take away sins, he had to have no sin. Job says, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. So, for the Lord Jesus Christ to cleanse our sins, he also had to be clean. That's why it was important for him to be sinless. And that's why the Holy Spirit had to overshadow Mary to make sure that the Lord Jesus Christ is without sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, it says, And you know that he was manifested to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. So the Holy Spirit was involved in the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let us look at his ministry. Was the Holy Spirit involved in the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, he was. He anointed Christ, probably at his uh, baptism. At his baptism, he conferred power. Okay. In this case, the Holy Spirit was himself the anointing. So, designating Jesus, this anointing was designating Jesus as the King and Messiah of Israel. So, it was saying that the Lord Jesus Christ is the King. He is the Messiah. This anointing introduced him into his public ministry. As Acts chapter 10 verse 38 says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing those who were oppressed by demons. 
So, at his ministry, the Lord Jesus Christ was also, the, the Holy Spirit rather, was also part, was also part and parcel of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ depended on the Holy Spirit. The anointing empowered, he, and empowered Jesus for his public ministry. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the good news in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. So the Holy Spirit was also part of the, Holy, the anointing of the Holy Spirit uh, empowered the Lord Jesus Christ for his public ministry. The anointing was also a divine authentic, authentication of Jesus. It was saying that this Jesus is the Christ. As John says, in John chapter 1, verse 33 to verse 34, he says, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. Now, John the Baptist says, the Holy the God gave me this sign in order to recognize the Son of God, to recognize who among the Jews is the Son of God. He said, upon whom you see the Holy Spirit are descending upon him, this is the Son of God. So the anointing of the Holy Spirit was an authentication that the Lord was an authentication of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we also filled the Christ. In Luke chapter 4, it says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, the word full is in an in in imperfect tense, suggesting continuous action. So Christ Jesus was continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. So, the Lord Jesus Christ was continually, continuously under the guidance and the ministry and the leading of the Holy Spirit. So, he depended on the Holy Spirit. He was obedient to the Holy Spirit. Now, so the infilling of the Holy Spirit enabled the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to go into the wilderness, to be able to face the harsh conditions that are in the wilderness to be able to enjoy a time of fast. So now this tells us that the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit is not limited to the speaking of tongues or the performing of miracles. So you can be filled with the Holy Spirit so that you will be able to face a difficult time that is coming your way. So this is opening our mind to the infilling of the Holy Spirit because many of us think that when we are filled by the Holy Spirit, it means that you will be able to speak in tongues, you will be able to prophesy, you will be able uh, to perform signs and wonders. But the infilling of the Holy Spirit means that you are now, you have submitted, full, you have submitted yourself fully to the Holy Spirit. You are now being led and being guided by the Holy Spirit. Also looking at uh, chapter 6, when they chose those six deacons, or rather seven deacons, who were to look into the distribution of food, the, 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 the Word of God tells us when the disciples gave them the criteria of how to choose these men, he, the, the, the disciples said, choose men who are full of the Spirit, meaning men who walk under the leadership and who walk under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, men who do not walk according to their minds and their senses, men who do not walk according to their emotions, men who fear God, men who are submissive and obedient to God. These are the men whom, these are the men who are, whom we are supposed to choose to be, a, to, to, to be the ones to serve or to do this task. So this clearly tells us that to be filled by the Holy Spirit should not be limited to speaking in tongues or to prophesying. Now, moving further on, let us look at his, at his death. Was the Lord Jesus Christ, was the Holy Spirit involved at the death of our Lord Jesus Christ? 
Yes, he was. He played a role in the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 says, How much more, reading from Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14, it reads as follows, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? This tells us that when the, Holy, when the Lord Jesus Christ offered himself as an offering for sin uh, for us, he offered himself through the aid and the help of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was also involved in the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let us look at, at his resurrection. Was he involved at the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, he was indeed involved at the, res at the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does 1 Peter 3 verse 18 say? For Christ also suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Holy Spirit. But made what? Made alive by the Holy Spirit. This reveals clearly that the Holy Spirit was also involved in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So now we have seen that even though the Lord Jesus Christ was or is a perfect man, yet he needed the ministry of the Holy Spirit. From the time of his birth, Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit was part of the, 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 the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the time he commenced his ministry, his public ministry, the Holy Spirit was also part of that. To the time of him offering himself up, the Holy Spirit was also part of that. To the time of rising from the dead, he was also part of that as we have, we, we, we have studied. So, how much more then, we who are imperfect and mortal beings, do we not need Holy Spirit more than the Lord Jesus Christ? How then do we ignore him? How then do we jostle him? How then do we push him aside? How then do we ignore him? How then do we walk this journey of salvation without him? How then do we serve without him? This is a question that we need to ask ourselves. We need to go back to restoring the Lordship of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need to embrace him. We need to give him the, the, the opportunity. We need to give him opportunity to, to be able to minister fully in our lives. We need to open our heart. We need to allow him so that we'll be able to benefit from what he is, what he is able to aid us, to help us with. So I'd like us to end there tonight. Next week, we are going to look at the importance of the Spirit in the life of a believer as we have looked at his importance in the life and the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to pray as we close. We are going to pray and ask the Lord, the Word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ said to his disciples, it is to your own advantage that I should live because if I do not live, the Holy Spirit is not going to come. So I want us to pray and ask as we have seen through this short teaching that the Holy Spirit is more to us than what we think and we are still going to see and learn. I want us to pray and ask the Lord to please open our eyes to understand this advantage, to please open our eyes to be able to embrace and to know that it is to our own advantage that we Give Holy Spirit his rightful position in our lives. Let us pray. Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we thank you for teaching us and giving us understanding of your Spirit and his ministry in our lives. We repent, our Lord Jesus Christ, that we have not honored your Spirit. We have jostled him out of our lives. We have jostled him out of the church. We have not followed his command. We have resisted the Holy Spirit, as Stephen says. You have always resisted the Holy Spirit. Even we, 
who live in these times where not only the Holy Spirit comes upon us, but He indwells us, yet we resist Him even though He indwells us. We ask you, Lord our Savior, that you may forgive us. We ask you that you may pull us from this complacent state that we are in. We ask you that you may bring us to the state of understanding this advantage. As you said, and Stanley said to your disciples and said to them, I am living and my departure is for your own advantage. As these disciples did not understand at that time, Lord our Savior, we pray that Father, you may give us that understanding so that we may fully understand how advantageous it is that we embrace the Holy Spirit of truth. We thank you, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as you give us this understanding. We thank you as you open our hearts and you open every room in our heart so that Holy Spirit may be Lord. We thank you as you help us to surrender everything unto him in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Please join us uh, next week as we continue with our teaching on the Holy Spirit.